Okay, this next one is the Moody Blues, one of my favorite English bands of all time. Just, just below the Beatles, pretty much. My roommate in college, Andy Gilbert, turned me on to the Moody Blues. And before that, I only knew the obvious hits. But back in 1999, we got to do an interview with John Lodge and Justin Hayward, who couldn't have been the nicest guys. They were just, again, no ego like Carole King. Uh, just very cool just to talk about anything we wanted to talk about. And this was their box set they were promoting at the time. And they also had uh, Strange, Strange Times was a new album they had coming out. So they were nice enough to sign my little box set there, which was cool. But enjoy the Moody Blues, Justin Hayward, and John Lodge. Oh, that's, that's incredible. I mean, I, you can I, see I, how I the French it. lost the war. Look at what one on that is more famous than the Wizard. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know anybody else. Take you. Um, speeding. Okay. Well, we'll just cut right to the chase, if you don't mind, James. Yeah. And um, talk about the current tour and the new album. Mm. And first off, why the name uh, Strange? Times. Where did that come from? Strange, well, they are <laughs> strange times, and um, I think it, it was a song that um, that we worked on. Right, it was the first song that we recorded for this album, and we went down to Italy to a little studio there to make a, um, a demo of it, and we loved the way it sounded so much that hey, that was the record, and then that became the starting point for the rest of the uh, rest of the album, and then we kept. During the tours, we had a lot of uh, big touring schedule, lots of different places the last uh, couple of years. And so every time we had a couple of weeks, we'd go back down and do a couple more songs. And then finally completed it just to, towards the end of last year, just over Christmas, yeah. So it wasn't all in just one sitting? Right? No, no we, we, we've we been recording for um, uh, at least two years. and. Um, it's been an interesting uh, way of recording because uh, it's allowed us to have some time and space and to be able to make sure uh, what we've been doing is exactly what we want and how we feel the song should be. And I think Strange Times is really our millennium album, you know, because things are changing through the world, you know, lots of things are changing. Uh, people are taking different stances on everything. and. Um, I think, you know, because it was the first song uh, that we wrote together for this new album, and it was the first song we recorded, as Justin was saying, um, it became something special. And uh, it sort of showed us, I think, the, uh, uh, the, the road or the route we were going to go uh, to make the album. And uh, it, it really enabled us to produce the album ourselves, because we produced the first song ourselves. And so everything else grew from that. Any concerns about that being the theme of this tour? <laughs> <laughs> Strange times. Strange. Are you anticipating something happening out there on the road? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I hope the world doesn't end before they pay us. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but well, who cares anyway? Yeah. But uh, you won't it, be able to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, pay off a few debts before. But uh, no, I, I think it's an apt title for the times, uh, and I can't remember in all our time really touring the world when uh, things probably have been stranger than this. And uh, with the, um, the, the way that the media reacts to things nowadays and, um, and the, uh, the obsession with sort of personality and private stories, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting place. But uh, I think... Uh, you know that, uh, that that it is a good theme because I think people do recognise that, and um, so that uh, I think it'll be a, it'll be a useful uh, theme for us to we're we're on, we're we're on the road with this album probably for the next year, maybe two years with it because mm. we really believe in this. It's a very important project for us, the best thing we've ever done, and uh, so uh, that's why we're going to stick with it right through into the next uh, you know millennium. And the strange times, you know, we are entering the, you know, the year 2000, and everyone is, uh, everyone over the last 10 years has come to live with uh, uh, everything working for them. You know, when they touch something, it works. The car door works. The refrigerator works on the basic levels. The computers work, and the telephones, and the bookings for airlines. But uh, you know, suddenly it comes up to, in everyone's face that just a minute, there may be something wrong. At the year 2000, you know, the bug may hit everyone. But I think it's that awareness 
And I think this is what the album's about, you know, it's a, a personal awareness album. And I think when people listen to it and uh, listen to the lyrics, they will see the personal side that uh, I think is really important. I think we're at a stage a lot of the times in life now where <clears throat> people always want an answer or want to apportion whatever it is onto someone else. But really, at the end of the day, it comes back to yourself. Why did it take 30 years for you to finally decide to self-produce your own album? Well, I suppose, in a way, we've been doing that for 35 years, except getting someone else to take the blame. <laughs> so uh, that's what one of us, what Tony Visconti always says anyway, that we had a lot of success as a producer with, you know. He says, well, you always did, you know, it's just that you pin, used to pin it on me for a while and make him take it home with him and worry about it. And I think that the time was right. We knew what we wanted. We met someone, we met a couple of boys down in Italy, um, one called Danilo Modonia and Alberto Parodi, who ran the studio there. And when we met, when John and I first met Danilo, we realized that we had uh, a way to channel our songs and to make them work. And because because now this is the first album that we've recorded purely on onto a computer we were able to look at the things we'd recorded we were look at we were able to sample ourselves we sampled some of our own sounds we're still using some of our old mellotron sounds from the 60s which are in english sunset the first uh, single as well and and right through the album there's some uh, older sounds and uh, so it was the first time we'd really done that and it gave us the flexibility of being able to uh, to to look at things and to just just record in a very different way mm -hmm. so in in the end i don't think this time that we needed anybody else's interpretation of our songs it's time for us to um, put our money where our mouth is and just take that responsibility yeah i mean when you when you write a song you know it's it's uh, an incredible uh, personal experience uh, and the song becomes very precious and I think you know when you're a teenager and you first meet a producer um, you want someone else to put their thoughts into it because you you don't know you never know how good it is you know as you, from your own self you know you know you like it but you don't know if it's any good and you're always looking for someone else to add things to it and I think over the years as as uh, different arrangements have been added to your own songs, you're trying to put your own arrangements in there as well. And sometimes you can get this cacophony where you get the things counteracting each other, you know, on the final um, final song, the how you wanted it. And uh, I think this time uh, the recording is uh, very pure, lots of space. And I think it allows the listener to be able to have their own images of what the song is about. Speaking of when you were a teenager there, um, who were some of your big uh, influences growing up? What was the music types and stuff that you liked and preferred? Me, I like when I was a little tiny kid, I used to like Johnny Ray. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. but I really found, I mean, that f f I found what I was looking for with uh, Buddy Holly, along with a lot of other English kids, really, 1957. And that was, oh, it all suddenly made sense. It was Buddy who sang, wrote, and played guitar and um, led his own group. You know, he wasn't a singer out the front. Buddy Holly, of course, and then for us, we were swept up um, in, at the time with the, with the Beatles. And the Beatles, I suppose, were, when we, when we first started, were our leaders, <laughs> in a way. And um, they were the most important figures, so... Uh, that, that what people, what they did, the rest of us can kind of followed. So uh, that was it for me. And a lot of other heroes, the Everleys, and taught me harmonies and things like that. I think um, uh, what introduced me to music, I was really not, I suppose as a musician, I wasn't really uh, interested in, in making music until I saw uh, some of the first American movies that en came to England, sort of The Girl Can't Help It which had sort of Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran and uh, and these people were in enormous icons, you know, English people really couldn't do that because it's very hard to be uh, this rebel without a cause type person that all these rock and rollers were coming from America, you know, it just didn't work really as, a, as an English person, you became a really a facsimile of what it was. And um, then I think the thing that Justin and I had in common at the time, we both, Buddy Holly, 
came along and showed how to do it as a person, that you could write your own songs. You didn't have to be this huge sex symbol, you know, and uh, this, uh, this rebel. And uh, I managed to uh, have the privilege of seeing Buddy Holly uh, perform live when he came to the UK to tour uh, with the crickets. And that was an amazing experience, you know, and I knew then that's how to do it. And uh, that's what we've been doing ever since. What about some of the recording artists of mm. today? That, who do you think mm. the Moody Blues have influenced? Who knows? That's uh, a lot mm. of people ask us that. I don't know. Who knows? Mm. I'm not sure that we've directly influenced anyone, but we were part of a um, we were part of a, a sound and a kind of backdrop to a generation through the 60s and early 70s that that is still very powerful and I, and I hope will never be forgotten because it was a time when music was uh, played such a big part in people's lives and before it became a, a product or um, something that to that to to sell. And uh, so there was an honesty about it then, and I think people will, will always recognise that about that time. They weren't having it rammed down their throat, they were able to choose, and they'd choose a lot of l live music. But I think when uh, we, we, had a, we had a sound and a look about us that still is... Um, that still you, you see in people today and in young people, and because that's the way you look when you when you're young and you want those uh, those kind of nice clothes and the sort of flowing kind of look that we had, kind of fluid fluidity about the band. So I, I, it'd be very difficult to to put a name on anyone because uh, they certainly wouldn't own up to it, <laughs> and like like I wouldn't at the time, you know. And uh, but uh, when, when we were younger, either because everyone thinks they're original and unique. But I hope our contributions have been many, you know, particularly in making the album something that was, instead of a group of hit singles and B-sides, became something that was uh, 50 minutes of uh, real experience and pleasure. Mm. Um, well, in your Wildest Dreams video, don't you think you guys were really the one that launched the 60s retro with that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> oh, yes, that's great. <laughs> I mean, Austin Powers Thank owes you. it all to you guys, that's the way it I see does, it. Yeah. <laughs> We're always yeah. too far in advance to take advantage of it, though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea was that? <laughs> Uh, well, the, the idea was in the song. The song was so obvious, and instead of but so many videos that the makers that we've worked with, when when we've got the new hip video maker in to, you know, by the record company to do our song, we've always had a song that's been so simple in its story. That's all we're doing. We're telling nice stories, and uh, we've always ended up with something. Oh, we can't do that. It's too obvious. So we'll do something weird, and you're coming down that beach, and uh, but it's nothing to do with that. But um, so uh, uh, really, I, I think uh, we, we just, John and I were just on a plane, and we said, well, really, this is how it should be. Just start mm -hmm. with that, go with that, da 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 and uh, just tell the story of the song, and we end up at the concert, and that's it, you know. And, uh, and, that, and we've, we've worked with um, a great director, a friend of ours, that we've done a lot of TV uh, with, and um, he, he just said, yeah, great, that's the way to do it. Let's just do that, and set up and did it, and... Uh, and we, we won the Video of the Year award for, for that, so it was, uh, it was brilliant, yeah. It was uh, probably one of the best uh, seven hours Justin and I spent on a plane coming back from New York to London that we've ever spent, really, you know, instead of going to sleep overnight. We worked on the whole concept of uh, the video, and uh, there it is now. It's part of uh, video history as well. It really is great. What, what was your direction and involvement in the uh, box set? Well, the the um, our involvement in the box set was, I suppose, primarily with the packaging of it, and uh, the the archive stuff, all the photographs and the old material, you know, you know was ours, and um, the uh, the the collection of uh, the music was actually uh, put together by um, by the record company by Polygram, and I suppose just by uh, you know canvassing people of what they really thought and what they really wanted. And I think they really did a good job. I think it would have been very difficult for any one of us to start putting it together and saying this is what should be there because it's, uh, you'd get uh, several different versions of it. So we, we left that actually to them and I think they came up with the right yeah. kind of mix. I think it's, you know, it, we wanted a box set. We were just involved really with the packaging and we wanted something that um, uh, as a box set it was something that you'd be proud to have 
on your coffee table or on your bedside table or wherever. It's not something you put away in a shelf and locked, but something you could leave out and people would browse through it and look. So we wanted something very special. And uh, I think we achieved that, you know. It's a very nice package. I think also, you see, it was uh, Time Traveller, the box set, was, was, was compiled by a guy mm -hmm. called Bill Lew uh, Levinson, who is a fan, a real Moody Blues fan, and I think that we all recognise mm -hmm. that probably the best thing would be a fan's idea of, the, uh, of what should be on it, so that's why we left it as it was. How is it that you think your music stands the test of time? And, and two-part kind of a thing here and, and what is the appeal for the new fans that are hearing the moody blues for the first time and, and really actually just loving you guys it's got to make you feel great but how how's that work i i mean it's it's a difficult question really because uh it's probably you'd have the answer to the philosopher's stone if you knew what it was because you could then tell everyone else how to do it but i think uh if there is a secret it's that you have to go back to the very beginning and we got together to make our own music, to write and perform our own music. And we've kept truthful to that from, you know, from the mid 60s. And today we still, that's exactly what we still do. We don't accept anyone else's influence. We don't take anyone else's songs. It's just down to us. And uh, I think uh, the audience see a truthfulness in that. And I think they can relate to what we're doing. And I think um, someone who's 20 years old today can relate to a song that re we wrote when we were 20 because it was truthful then so if it was truthful then it has to be truthful now and um, only the time changes five minutes jeff well i think uh, that um that the songs that we made when we were young st seem to be uh, relevant to the young people now i think those are issues of that, that are in uh, that uh, uh, concern young people are still the same. So I think they respect the music that we did then. And so many young kids that I know discover the Moody Blues from our yeah. earlier music. I think um, that the strength, our strength is in our songs and that uh, we're, we're a group of songwriters uh, that, um, that that is the most powerful thing that we have. And uh, the, you know we all learned back in Tin Pan Alley in the 60s mm -hmm. that uh, if you've got a song, you've got you've got a record, and if you haven't got a song, you've got you've got nothing. You know, you had a backing track, but what can you do with it? So, um, I hope that si since the since the Red Rocks uh, concert that we did with the Colorado Symphony Orchestra, then that show has brought a lot of our old fans back. They thought, oh, it's okay to come and see them again now, and um, we're we're very lucky to have the following that we have. And I know we've got a long tour in front of us, well, probably till till the end of the year. And I know we're going to meet a lot of people that we've seen many times over the years who always come to see us. And we're going to see a lot of new faces because of the music on Strange Times, because of the orchestra, because of a lot of different things. The, um, it's, it's quite interesting. We, you know, we have uh, our offices in England and we, and we run... Uh, uh, we get a lot of mail from people all over the world. And we've been getting a lot of mail quite recently over the last two years from Generation X's, and the first time it arrived, I said to uh, uh, my secretary, I said, what's a Generation Xer? You know, because it was, you know, quite an anomaly. But it's quite interesting to see how people are writing of 23, 24 years of age and talking about our music. And uh, you can't even go back to when they were born because even that was only halfway through the Moody Blues career, you know. So, there was something different that they've latched onto. So uh, uh, we're not too sure what they've latched onto either, to be honest, you know, but it can only be, I would think, you know, the, the truthfulness that's in the music and our, our relating to the same um, hopes and dreams and despairs that everyone else has. You know, there's so many hmm. other things I wanted to talk to you about, but real quickly, if I could just ask you, hmm. uh, and if you could maybe just uh, paraphrase my question into your answer. What's it like playing Las Vegas? <laughs> um, well, we, we've, we started playing Las Vegas when it became kind of okay to play Las Vegas because so, we, went, we went there once and, and I saw, um, not to play, but I saw Neil Young playing at Bally's and I thought, oh, it must be all right now. <laughs> I thought, that's okay. And then they had a lot of country acts as well. 
And um, we, it, uh, over the years, um, the uh, the people at Caesar's Palace have been very, very good to us. And they 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 were just a great organisation to work for. Uh, kind of old, established, and uh, very friendly, and real old kind of show business. So it it was almost a selfish thing on our part, I think, because we felt so good and always had such a good time there and felt so comfortable. And the last five or six years, we've seen Las Vegas kind of turn around into being a family kind of place and uh, some, something somewhere where a lot of people now want to play. They're queuing up to play there. And uh, but uh, the Caesars have always been faithful to us as well, and you know, said so we can come back at any time. And it's great for our fans; they love it that we're in one place for a certain number, mm. spent amount of time, and we've we've enjoyed it very much. And um, I think for us as well, you know, we, we really started in England when we started to have some success. When we moved out of the clubs, we started to play in theatres in England. You know, two thousand seat theatres and that's where you performed in England and in Europe and I think uh, you know playing in Vegas because you've got a huge stage but a very small audience it's it's a very quiet um, position to be in you know it's a, you know, the sound we, and we can concentrate on getting the harmonies right the vocals right uh, the, the, the uh, arrangements right and it really is sort of for us going back to being in the theatres in England and you really can at some stages though because we do rock songs as well but I mean you can on the ballads you can actually do hear that pin drop and you know when you can hear pin drop you've got those 2,000 people with you all the way. Just real quickly Les, mm. is there anything, uh, any new projects, films, videos, books, mm. paintings or anything, what's in the future for you guys? Well, I think there's a lot of stuff around this tour and around the gigs that we're doing and uh, we're hoping to do um, a couple of televised shows during the next few months. And really our focus is on um, promoting this album, uh, obviously because it's so important to us and touring around it. We're touring back in the United Kingdom again um, early next year. And so uh, at, the, at the moment our, our minds are just fixed on this project. Yeah, to total focal attention on uh, strange times, you know, because it, it is important to us. And, uh, you know, we have been working with it for two years, and it's, you know, very precious. I think Tim just needs you right. to do a couple of uh, tosses or something for this and for airline and everything. Oh, okay. <clears throat> if you could look right in the lens, one yeah. to say, uh, hi, I'm Tusha, Justin, yeah. uh, John from Moody Blues. Uh, thanks for flying with us today. Okay. okay. Do right into the lens, that would be very... Hi, I'm Justin Hayward from the Moody Blues. And I'm John Lodge from the Moody Blues. And thank you for flying with us today. Good. And another one I'm getting on recently is Princess Cruises. Oh, yeah. So if you oh, could say they, something they, about that. Oh, they come around my way. They go around the Mediterranean as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well I can't. Well, what, 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 Hi. Oh, Hi. I'm wing it. Here we go. Okay. Hi, I'm John Lodge of the Moody Blues. And I'm Justin Hayward. Oh, the, I thought you were going to say something. Well, you just said Vince's cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say you oh, come you by, do by my way. I thought a bomb boy out. Oh, you a very oh okay, that's a good one. Your, your yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm John Lodge. And I'm Justin Hayward of the Moody Blues. And we, sorry, go do it again. Hi, I'm John Lodge. And I'm Justin Hayward of the Moody Blues. And we wish you a bon voyage on Princess Cruises. Perfect.